God working or us working, the answer is yes. And the, and the truth of it is in the tension, even in that one verse. So, uh, so we talked about theological language. And the reason we can speak about God at all is because part one of the book, God meets us. Uh, the strange thing in the book, when I started writing, I started in writing about the doctrine of creation, and I wound up making that the second section, and God meets us the first section, because I realized that we have been claimed before the foundation of the earth, that God actually met us even before God made us, which is kind of a weird way of thinking. But in the eternal mind of God, in the eternal being of God, we have always been known, always been beloved, always been included. We're that precious to God. A human analogy for that that I include in the book, it comes from a story about a friend of mine. You may know her. She won't mind if I tell you who she is. Amy Black Johnston. Did you know Scott Black Johnston? He's the pastor of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, but he uh, used to teach on the faculty uh, with us at Austin. And she and Scott were trying to have kids for a long time before they actually had a beautiful girl named Isabella and then a beautiful boy named Oliver. And every Christmas she would write on the Christmas boxes, are you here yet? Are you here yet? This, I hope this is your first Christmas. She would write messages to her first child. So there's a way in which, um, <laughs> this mysterious, right? Even in human relationships, we meet each other who we yearn to be with, children we yearn to have, beloved ones we yearn to share life with before we've even, they've even come to be. How much more true is that for God? So God reveals God's self when God meets us and gives us things to say about who God is that are true, even though who God is can never be exhausted by our words. That's what we kind of touched on two weeks ago. So this week we're talking about how this God who meets us, makes us. And this is true, this is true not only in the sense that God pronounced the existence of Adam and then Eve, bone of bone, flesh of flesh, the two will be one flesh, reflecting the image of the Imago Dei, the image of God, and God said it is very good and gave Adam and Eve instructions. This is true also in every day of our lives. Every breath we take, every move we make, we believe God is not only watching us from a distance, catch that illusion, Bette Midler, uh, Bette Midler song, but that God is making us every day, forming us, conforming us, scripture says, to the image of the Son. Next week is Pentecost. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit came and continues to form us, continues to form the church, continues to form us as a parable and promise of the kingdom of God for the whole world. The Holy Spirit will come and nurture us and feed us. We went to worship this morning and heard about the ascension. We were fed with the word of God, nurtured um, uh, by the God who uh, makes us. So the, the work of God is ongoing. The creative work of God is ongoing. The word in theology we use for that is providence. God is providentially involved in everything that we do. And now I'm going to come back to that in one minute. Let me just do a tiny preview for next week. Next week, we're going to talk about God sends us out into the world. That's a pretty good theme for Pentecost. God sending us out of the world, the God who meets us, who makes us, sends us out in the world. How do we go out in this world, especially when we're not allowed to go out in the world? Um, how do we go out in the world and make it so? Make it so, make the kingdom of God so. The, the way I'm going to frame it next week is how do we help shape the new normal? Not just react to it, not just survive it, but how are we vehicles through which God shapes the new normal? What is it that God desires and how do we do the will of God that brings God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. So back to providence, we're right smack in the middle now. God makes us. This is a doctrine that gets us into trouble, this idea that God not only made us like a divine watchmaker, makes a watch, 
and hands it to us and says, here's your watch. Here's creation. Here it is. Put it on your wrist. I'm out of here. Hope it works for you, but you got to take good care of it. You're going to have to fix it yourself. If it breaks, you're going to have to get the parts. I'll be over here rooting you on, right? No, we believe that God is in the mechanism of the watch, in the mechanism of creation, um, giving us every breath that we take, every thought that we have, or caring about it. See, this gets tricky real quickly because we're not puppets. This is another big problem in theology. Agency, we call it double agency in theology. What does God do? What do we do? Yes. That's like the verse in Philippians 2. Who acts? Is it God or is it us? Yes. Our conviction is in the person of Jesus Christ who entered into these bones and this flesh. God acts and we are lifted up ascension right to participation in the life of god as who we are as agents as those who can see the will of god and do it and participate with this one who john 15 no longer calls us servants but calls us friends but now to the point of the day this causes us a lot of problems See, it'd be easier if we believed God created the universe as a kind of watch we could put on our wrists and left us in charge. When bad things happen, we can say, oh, we messed up again. We've got to figure out how to fix the watch. God's cheering us on. But that's not God's business. It's our business. We have to honor and respect what God has given us. It's up to us. It's not up to God. Um, so we would have no one to blame for the coronavirus or the sufferings of the world but ourselves. And maybe we'd find ways out of blaming ourselves, but we really couldn't uh, cry out to God uh, for what things happen in the world. Um, the question of, of asking why is there suffering is premised in our conviction that God has promised us certain things, that God has promised us that the days of our lives will be long upon the face of the earth, that God will, will, um, will wipe every tear away from every eye, that someday every stomach will be fed and lions and lambs and wolves will lie down together. There are all sorts of crazy promises that God makes to us in scripture. Fortunately, there are a lot of people in scripture who notice that they don't always seem to bear out yet right and they're a little ticked off about it at times how long oh lord why oh lord right you promised oh lord right psalm 42 even says if i had done been unfaithful to you this would be understandable lord but i've been faithful to you and you haven't been faithful to me right there in psalm 42 44 22 job job of course we know was righteous. That's the premise of the whole book. His wife says, yeah, you're righteous. God isn't keeping his end of the deal. Curse God and die. She stands by her man. Uh, and Job says, I'm not letting God off that, the hook that easy. Uh, God made promises to me. I'm righteous. I kept my end of the deal. He didn't say, by the way, honey, God doesn't have anything to do with this. Children die. Uh, natural disasters uh, destroy houses. I got a virus. I'm covered with sores. That, leave God out of it. He said God has everything to do with this. He believed that God was involved in his life, but that's what caused him, in a sense, more pain and more struggle. So this, this is kind of difficult for us. The reason, the reason the question of suffering is such a big deal is precisely because we have faith that God has to do with everything. Does that make sense? If we didn't believe that, we could go with what Harold Kushner says in his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, which is a good book, but not Christian and not Reformed. Chapter 5 says, God can't do everything. God can't do everything. There's a coronavirus, right? God, God couldn't stop that. God can't heal people, right? Uh, God doesn't, that's not the way God works. Well, we believe God is involved with everything. Now, I'm not saying that that means you get, can get into hot water real quick, but I don't see anyone raising their hand yet or hitting a gong. 
it doesn't mean that God caused the coronavirus. I'm going to tell you what I think and feel free to start jumping in. I have my eye on you if anyone wants to raise their hand or wave the flag. Um, I don't think God causes suffering because I don't see scripture teaching that, that God causes suffering. I do think that I hope that God can use suffering for good, but that's you know, real close sometimes to saying uh, that God causes it. That can almost be dangerous, because if I say to someone, which I would never say, your aunt died of coronavirus, and I'm hoping that God uses that for good, that could come across as get stop crying, stop being so upset with God, and look and see how God is using this for good, right? And, and then we're not allowing in our spirituality for people to cry out and ask the question Jesus asked on the cross, the question Job asked in the book of Job, the question Martha asked in John 11, which is on the outline, and I didn't write that after the sermon this morning that you heard, but before. Martha says, if you had come, my, my brother would not have died. If you had come, those are cries and questions of faith that people ask when the God whose promises they trust seems not to have come through, seems not to have come through. So I don't think God causes suffering. I strongly believe we have to uh, renounce that idea. And I also think it's too quick to say this sentence, everything happens for a reason. Has anyone ever said that to you? Everything happens for a reason. Well, that's, that's too easy. Remember two weeks ago, we were talking about thinking deeply about that. I'll tell you a story um, more deeply than that about theology. Uh, do you remember when the tornado hit Gerald a few years ago? It was a long time ago. I think it was 1997, a few years ago. Uh, May, of, May 27th, 1997, I believe was the date. I happened to be doing a series up in Round Rock on this subject of suffering then. And one Sunday morning, I drove to Round Rock right after the tornado had killed 29 people. And I walked into the church and a woman whose husband had been killed and son was in intensive care, he had thrown their young son into a cast iron uh, tub. And then his wife, uh, on top of his son and then he was on top of his wife and his son in this cast iron, iron tub to protect them. The tornado took him and killed him. She was okay. The boy made it, but at the time of the class he was in intensive care. And I did the series for three or four weeks and every week she sat there with a smile like this on her face. It seemed, this is a little bit of a judgment, but it seemed kind of fake. I mean, People could have a real smile, but to me, I just wondered. And at the end of the series, she came up to me and she said, Dr. Rigby, she said, thanks so much for this series. I just know that everything happens for a reason. And I said a quick prayer and took a risk and said, well, I don't think this makes any sense at all. I don't understand how God could let this happen. And I'm asking the question, why? Well, she um, broke into tears started sobbing and uh and we developed a friendship and and uh and uh prayed together and and prayed through some of the lament psalms so the question i'm thinking about with this coronavirus is if we feel that we can't ask the why question what it, what does that implication does that have to the detriment of our spirituality right what's the consequence of that to our spirituality why is it important for us to ask the why question. And you know, we, the why question can't be answered. So it's tempting to say that if it can't be answered, we shouldn't ask it. We should ask some other question. But again, I see Jesus asking it, Martha asking it, people all through scripture asking it. So I'm thinking, how can it be beneficial? Not as the only question or, or way of reflecting that we engage in, but as an important, uh, as an important way of engaging. Um, Anyone want to say anything yet? I can keep going a little more. Cindy, could you 
talk to us a little bit about, I mean, I think what you just said is hugely important. So I kind of want to mark that, that um, asking this question, even if it doesn't have an answer, it's hugely important to our spiritual life, our spiritual development. Right. Um, and I mean, that makes sense knowing that the lament Psalms are an important part of Hebrew scripture that, you know, we have those laments or certain laments in the New Testament as well. But um, uh -huh. can you say more about how this is important in our, in our spiritual lives? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Um, first of all, the, the woman who had come into the Sunday school class that day, and um, many other people I've met, I saw a lot of nods when I told that story, uh, avoid coming to church um, the week after something awful happens in their lives. I had a friend named um, Lois, whose husband dropped dead when she was 42, and she had four kids, and she was, she was uh, uh, reticent to go to church the next Sunday. Isn't that awful? She was an elder in the church, Presbyterian church, and didn't want to go because she didn't think she could bear the eyes, you know, and the questions and the aphorisms. Um, God never, never gives us more than we can bear, right? The easy answers, the, the, the banning of the why question really answers that, that would shut her down to crying out and lamenting and saying why. See, see the why question is the question of lament. It's the question of authenticity. It's the question that we ask when we're being uh, uh, honest with God about who we are and what our frustrations are about and what our life circumstances are. So the reason to ask the why question is so we can stay in intimate rela relationship with God the way Job does. By the end of that, that book, I mean, Job, Job and God, I mean, they, they're duking it out. They got the whirlwind and all this stuff, but they are close. They are close. The lament psalmist, you know how people sometimes say, it's too bad those Jewish people didn't know uh, Jesus. They would know that God is near and close and not far away. <laughs> we know Jesus. And this is a kind of anti-Semitic thing to say, by the way. But you read those lament psalmists, and they are so tight with God. They are so honest and authentic, so unafraid that God's going to hit the smite button. So, and, and what is that? What is that? What is the reason for that? They trust God as a child trusts a parent. And by the way, having faith as children isn't about not asking questions. When you really trust your parents to come through on their promises, you ask them, why, why, why? Why haven't you taken me to the park yet? Why haven't I gotten PlayStation 4? Why isn't this coronavirus done yet? Why am I not able to do my work? Why, why, why? It's a faithful question of intimacy and relationship. By the way, um, by the way, um, in love relationships, I'm thinking um, husband, wife, spouse, uh, partners, close friends, in the most intimate relationships, we ask why a lot when the other person fails. If Stacy, this has not happened, this is hypothetical, but if Stacy and I got to be better friends, which I'm, that's not hypothetical, I really hope we do, because I like Stacy. But if we are, get really tight and I promise her something um, and I don't come through, I hope she would come to me and say, why? Or where were you? last Tuesday night. And if she said, if she doesn't ask that, she's given up on the relationship. She said, oh, well, Cindy said she would do it, but she doesn't really care. So the asking of the why question can be a claiming of the, of the intimacy of the relationship itself. Uh, Lois, by the way, Lois, 42, husband drops dead, couldn't get herself to go to church um, that next Sunday until she realized it would be worse if she didn't go because all her friends would, would go straight to her house after church. So she made a plan. I'm seeing lots of nods, which I'm naming because this is not an isolated story. She made a plan to come into the worship service late so she didn't have to talk to people before the service. And then she made a plan to leave the service in, during the singing of the final hymn so she wouldn't have to go to the dreaded coffee hour and have to engage with her friends, 
<laughs> so she's about to leave the service and the pastor, Sherm, uh, gives her the eye. Ah, they were friends and she was sitting in the back. It was a small New England church, you know, I'm, a, I'm from up north. Uh, and and uh, she's sitting near the back door, which is open, ready to scoot out the back door. And Sherm gives her the eye. He comes down, says the benediction with his arm around her from the back, and then whispers in her ear, I'm glad you're here. And she says, Sherm, I have to get out of here. I can't bear to talk to people. And he says this, whatever you do, don't be mad at God. I can imagine saying that. We don't want our friend to hurt. We don't want her to feel pain. We, we, don't, we want her to be able to get through it. Maybe skipping the unanswerable question of why um, is the way to go. Well, Lois said that she didn't go back to church for five years, not because she was mad at Sherm, but because she was mad at God and she felt guilty about it. So th those are a couple of things that I have in mind when I think of uh, not banning the why question at the door. But let me tell you a little more uh, about what I think about this. There's a great theologian named Jürgen Moltmann. Anyone heard of Moltmann? Moltmann, he's still alive. He's not a dead white male German theologian, but a living white male theologian. He made a huge contribution. Anyway, he uh, one time did a talk that I listened to about suffering and he got up and he said, you Americans always want to know the answer to why. I don't want anyone to ask me why they're suffering. <laughs> Notice though, he didn't say we shouldn't ask the why question. He was trying to say that we can't answer the why question and that we need to realize that. He said, he said, um, he said don't ask me to give you an answer because I can't answer. So he does this whole incredible lecture on suffering and the first woman who comes up to the microphone in the Q&A says, Professor Moltmann, I know you told us that we couldn't answer the why question and you didn't want to answer it. And I'm sorry, but if you, I know you, you can't answer, but if you really had to say something, what would you say? And everyone laughed and he, to my surprise, answered the question. He said, I would say, very carefully, think 500 level theology. He, he would say, I would say, for the glory of God, and everyone kind of gasped. <gasps> God doesn't cause suffering for God's glory, right? And then he quoted from um, Mark chapter 9 and Mark chapter 11. There are a couple of places in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus uh, heals a man born blind. And the disciples say, why was this man born blind? Was it for his glory or the gl was it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? That's John chapter 9, and John chapter 11 is the other text. Um, why did Jesus tarry before he went to heal Lazarus, to respond to Martha and Mary's request that he come? Why did he tarry? What does he tell the disciples? The disciples in John chapter 11 that you heard preached on today are, um, are, are asking Jesus, why are we not going? Why are we not going? Why are we sitting around? And Jesus says, so that the Father can be glorified. The Father will be glorified. Now, this is a, a tough answer to the question of why. I still think Moltmann's right. We're better off saying we can't answer the question. But I think it's still worth asking because asking the question keeps us in intimate relationship with God. Gives, keeps us reflecting on authenticity and keeps us thinking about where is God in relation to this situation? When we hear Jesus crying on the cross, why hast thou forsaken me? We're looking around to say, has God forsaken him? The question itself uh, leads us to look for the presence of God and look for uh, uh, what we might not comprehend, be open to things that we can't figure out. And I think that's what Moltmann meant. I think he meant there's no possible way to solve this problem of why, but we are gonna keep hoping nonetheless that God being bigger than us is gonna find a way to remedy this. Not as an escape hatch from dealing with the present, but as a way to keep on looking, keep on watching, keep on stomping our feet, praying the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come already. And we do have occasional moments 
where we're able to look back. I wish this happened more than it does happen, frankly, but we do have moments where we look back and say, I can see how God took what was evil and used it for good. Remember, that's the quote that Joseph says when his brothers find themselves in a famine and have to go to the palace and they like, oh no, our brother's in charge. Our brother who we sold into slavery and beat up and threw in a ditch. This maybe is not good. Joseph sees them, loves them, and says, don't worry. What you intended for evil, God intended. God has used for good. Um, so I think what Moltmann means is, in the long run, we're going to keep looking to God, keep uh, 42 chapters of Job's inpatient patience saying, it's not too late, God. I know that my Redeemer lives. Show me the money. Show me the money, O Lord. That's my translation of the Lord's Prayer sometimes. Thy kingdom come. Show us the money, right? You promised. We've been praying this prayer for 2,000 years. And then when we say, thy, king, thy will be done, we get a little uh, sheepish and say, but I know that you're going to send me to be vehicles, uh, ambassadors of your word of revel reconciliation in the world. So that's next week being sent. Uh, anyone want to say anything yet? I see people fidgeting a little like they want to talk. Ellen? Uh, Janice? You have to turn your mic off, on. Yeah, unmute, unmute, unmute Janice, there you go. Yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, I, I do a lot of couples therapy work with people and uh, I often encourage people not to ask the why, the why question. And the reason I do that is because it's too often followed by that answer is not good enough and lots of judgment. Oh, yeah, I imagine you can imagine that. And so then what I encourage people to do instead is ask, uh, help me understand. Please help me understand. And that is not using the word why but also it often invites the other person to look and see that they don't understand themselves why they did or didn't do or said or didn't say something. But it's not as judgmental. The why question tends to lead to judgment in a couple's breakdown. Okay. That's very helpful. Uh, so, may, I mean, do you think that we ask the question of God, help me understand that? Now, I don't think we have a relationship with God, per se, in our understanding of it, that is fearful of judgment, mm -hmm. like we are fearful that we, uh, that our partner is not okay, or that we're not okay, because that's a very intimate, here and now, existential relationship. It's a theological relationship. The faith-based relationship with God is deeply personal on the one hand, but not personal like in, in a relationship with a human being right in front of you that you're sharing your life with. It, maybe so, it should be. That's very insightful. So, so you think asking the why question of God is, is okay, is better than asking it of a human being? or more productive? Oh, I don't no. think it's more productive. I think that the why question, as you said earlier, just doesn't often have an answer. And so, and yet you want to know why, so you can continue to trust what you believe about God. And, uh, and actually, the understanding that God is mystery and that we choose to have faith, not because we understand, because if you need to understand to have faith, it's probably not faith. Uh -huh. It's reasonableness. Yeah. And we're longing for reasonableness, but it's really a faith-based inquiry. Well, there's a way in which I've seen... Yeah, yeah. That, I really appreciate your comments. Um, the why is, is not unreasonable, 
because we're trying to make sense of God's promises on the ground. So I think the question is a reasonable question to ask. Yeah, even if we can't answer it, always. Yeah, yeah. That, that's an but okay way to say it. When people just say, oh, I don't know, God works in mysterious ways and throw up their hands. Um, I'm not sure we've, that facilitates our participation in the mystery itself. It more is an abdication. Like uh, mm -hmm. it's more, that, that's a more magical thing to say than a mystery thing to say. Mystery allows for some logic. <laughs> Even if the logic is to- It is, allows for logic. But uh, you get to the place, at least in my life, I get to the place where logic is not really something I can understand regarding God's logic often, except in, in hindsight. Mm -hmm. In yeah. hindsight, I can see the blessings that come out of suffering. I can see that suffering often precedes transformation. Yeah. 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 I yeah, think well, Charlene wants to say uh, something, Cindy. Please. Charlene. Cindy, I'm Charlene. I'm looking for you. I think you must be on my next okay. screen. Hi, Charlene. Hi. Um, this may be too simplistic. It's uh, kind of scary to talk to you because you're like so much smarter. But uh, forgive me for that. But um, I've never thought of suffering as God's idea. To me, suffering as a result of original sin that, um, and it's kind of funny that uh, we, we ate the apple to uh, get the knowledge from, get the knowledge, right? Don't, don't eat from this tree. Of yeah. God. And yet that tree brought us to uh, incomplete knowledge where the why is, you know, the, we don't have the knowledge God, God wasn't ready for us to have that. And, and so I, let me start over. If suffering is a result of original sin, right? It's kind of a global suffering. I, I've always been troubled by this idea that your child is sick because of a sin that you did, right? I don't, I don't think that's what this is, but, but there's this um, suffering. So it's there, it's there because of man's failure. It wasn't ever God's intention. But God can, as you said, you quoted Joseph, and that's been on my mind in, in this whole discussion. God, suffering resulted from the plagues that God brought to Israel, but they allowed the escape of, um, of the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, of Egypt, but that brought about the escape of the Jews from Egypt. So mm -hmm. while I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job of trying no, to... No, you're not. No, you're not. It's hard on this Zoom thing. I, I, I have like <laughs> I don't 60% think, yeah, of my normal. normal. Suffering but, was God's idea. It brought, we brought it to the earth uh, through our sin, but then because it's there, God has used it as part of his larger plan. Right. That's very well articulated. The idea is we try to figure out how can we say, no, God does not will the coronavirus in the kind of uh, small sense that God hit the coronavirus button on the computer keyboard and sent it here. But does, that can be a hopeless position. That was Calvin's point when he talked about providence. If we didn't know that God was ultimately in charge right? God sovereignly in charge. And in that sense that ultimately God will work it into God's will. Exactly. Uh, we'd be non-functional in the world. So how do we say both things? That's exactly, you articulated exactly what we're working on. So for yeah. me, is, yeah, here's this imperfect thing. It's not imperfect because that was God's idea. When will this kingdom come so we can get back to what God intended for all of us? And, and that's not for us to know yet. I guess that's very, very simplistic, but that's how I get it. <laughs> I, I, in in uh, Presbyterian theology, Reformed theology, Calvin, not that Calvin's higher than God, Reformed theology isn't trying to set itself apart from biblical theology, but to articulate what it says in the biblical witness. But Calvin said, sin is not God's will. It's an aberration, right? 
So right. God's creative will didn't include the suffering wrought by sin. And as you said, God's redemptive will doesn't include the suffering wrought by sin. Um, and we're in the middle. We're between those two. Uh, of course, the, the coronavirus is tricky because it's not as easy to say that it's caused by sin, except as you articulated, uh, except if you go for the fallen world kind of argument. You know, would there, would there be coronavirus? Would there be a tsunami? Would there be uh, tornadoes that kill 29 people in jail if the world hadn't fa fallen? Um, that's a tough question. Some people argue, uh, no, that everything would be uh, uh, compatico and there wouldn't be this suffering. But one thing I'm trying to emphasize today is that God is related to everything, any kind of suffering, even if even suffering wrought by sin. Uh, Elie Wiesel, in the, his uh, memoir, Night, so Elie Wiesel was in a concentration camp. He was Jewish when he was 15. Maybe a lot of you know this story. It's a horrific story. Brace yourselves. There, he was um, in this camp, and they hanged three people one day, and they brought all the prisoners out uh, to observe them dead and hanging there for stealing bread. They marched all of the prisoners in front of the faces of the hanged uh, men, and one of the hanged men was just a boy, 15, the same age that the Wiesel was, and because his body weight was light, he wouldn't asphyxiate, and so he was hanging between life and death. His face was turning blue, and the soldiers, the Nazis, weren't even humane enough to shoot him, to kill him. And as uh, they were marched past these, uh, these bodies and this boy, uh, Wiesel heard one of the Jewish inmates say, where is God? Granted, this is the where question, not the why question, but I think there's a why built in, right? Where is God and why is God allowing this? Where is God? He heard it again, where is God? And the answer, he heard then someone said, there he is, he's hanging in the gallows. It's a crucifixion answer. On Friday night, resurrection is meaningless. But to say God is with us on Friday night is hopeful because we have not been abandoned. Anyway, the interesting thing to your point is the question wasn't why are these Nazis doing this to us? So even when moral evil is involved, moral um, sin is involved, we still ask, where is God? So this is why I say the point is, I think, in our spirituality, in our lives, not to lose that question day by day, where is God? And I'm, I'm, if, if there's a better way than saying why, help me understand this, or whatever, let's go for it. But, but uh, let me read one quote from N.T. Wright that I found. Uh, about the value of the why question though and asking these kinds of questions. It was in Time Magazine three weeks ago. I'll send Mike the link. Lament is what happens when people ask why and don't get an answer. And lament is important. It's important to create spaces for, to be able to lament. In the New York Times uh, headline today, they listed all 100,000 people in the US. They had this thing you could scroll down. Did anyone see that with 100,000 little icons of all the people who, who died? And I looked at it and went for one second and thought, oh, I don't need to do this. I get the point. And I thought, no, maybe I should. But man, that thing was long. It went on and on and on and on. And I got to the end and I felt like, why? Why? Lament, lament is what happened. Lament? is what happens when people ask why and don't get an answer. It's where we get, get to when we move beyond our self-centered worry about our sins and failings and brokenness around us in our world and the ways we have played a part of it in it. So it can lead us also to think of our complicity uh, and get us to the stunning we're gonna talk about next week. Stacy, did you wanna say something? I um, I think you've gotten really to the heart of where we started, and that is that there is 
whether we like it or not, admit it or not, and, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but there is something about getting to that place of lament for us as people of faith that does push us often to the next step God has for us in our spiritual development. I mean, I, I could probably name a half dozen places in my life where that's been the case. Um, and I, I bet many of you would say the same thing. Um, and yet we, who would want to do that? Right. I mean, who who wants to be there? Um, I think about that. Go ahead. Well, we want to skip over good Friday Easter. I mean, who doesn't want that? As Charlene was talking and you were talking, I was thinking of that father desperately approaching Jesus for help, you know, uh, with, with a sick child. I'm trying to remember where in the gospel, one of you guys can remember it, who, you know, Jesus says, I, I, I can do this. Do you believe that I can do this? And he goes, Lord, I believe help my unbelief. I mean, the same moment, you know, I love that guy, but that's that moment of growth of spiritual growth. Um, you know, I want to believe, I want to hope, but help me, help me, help me, Jesus, you know, um, yeah. right there. And Martha, too. Um, I love that that chapter. I can't believe Emily talked about it this morning. I'm going to have to go listen to her sermon. Uh, I understand that she was, uh, she's lamenting the death of her friend. And, and part of that lament, I'm sure, uh, is to ask God why, even though she doesn't know, uh, can't, she knows there's not going to be an answer. Um, but Martha just comes out. She's, she's waiting to sock it to Jesus, I think. I think she's watching out the window. She's got power. This woman is the coordinator of the, of the, of the retreat center that Jesus hangs out in with people. She coordinates all the food. We, we, we think of Martha as demurely holding a serving platter and mad at Mary because she won't help. Uh, but there's so much more to her that you see in this chapter. So, I mean, she takes Jesus down. I mean, why? Not because she has a right to, not even because she's right, but because they have a close relationship. Do we have that kind of relationship to God in Jesus Christ? Um, I think God wants to gift us with that. I really do. But she comes out and she says, Lord, I, I think she's got the scoldy finger. If you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. And uh, I suspect she said, you know, Jesus, I'm just saying, how many times have I hosted you here? How many times have you, you know, pledged your friendship to us, made us promises? How many times, all right? And how many times have I listened to you? How, and, and I call you, and you, what, what were you doing sitting around? And if Jesus said something like, I did it so my Father in heaven would be glorified, I'm not sure Martha would have been satisfied with that. Even if, of course, Jesus was right. I mean, sometimes you want to say to, to, to even Jesus, come on, can we get through today? Can you heal us today? I got stuff to do. And, and the remarkable thing, though, this parallel Stacy's um, drawing to the man in Mark who says, Lord, I believe, help me now. My unbelief is Martha lays it on the line as an act of faithfulness. See, we have to stop thinking of, of lament and asking the why question as, as unfaithfulness. It's faithfulness and what faithfulness looks like in the face of suffering and unanswerable questions. Because Jesus, I love this passage and think about it a lot these days. Jesus is a little um, worried about Martha because he loves her, I think. Because he says to her, are you saying that you don't believe in resurrection? Lord, I believe, help me now, my unbelief. Almost like, what? this might be going too far, but what have I done? Have I made this little one shaky in her faith? And Martha stands up tall and says, no, Lord, of course I believe in the final day that he will rise up again. And Jesus says, no, 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 I'm talking about now. Don't you believe that I'm the Messiah? And Martha, in that moment, makes an apostolic confession of faith. Apostolic confession of faith. You know, um, uh, some of you might have heard me talk about this uh, at one point. Uh, I'll send Mike the link again, because he loves getting these uh, last-minute emails from me to send out to the huge mailing list. Sorry, Mike. 
But there, there's in the Middle Ages, they painted a lot of pictures of Martha. A lot of them are Martha demurely serving with her eyes averted food to people. But a lot of them are Martha subduing a dragon. I kid you not, I've got to try to act this out. Um, so in the same era, they had all these pictures of men killing dragons and they'd be in armor and they'd have a, a, a knife and they'd have the cut off the head of the serpent or the dragon, they'd be dangling the head and the blood would be pouring out. But then there are all these pictures of Martha dressed in feminine garments with her hair blowing and, and bare feet. And you can't get this, but she'd have the mother point. And she'd be pointing at the dragon like this, look at my face. You know, the mom like, uh, the way my mom would look at us in church when we were goofing around, right? The mom's cold and the dragon's like this. And it's called Martha subduing the dragon. So I'm not saying I, I would never go this far, that Jesus is the dragon, but the whole setup of the righteous will prosper and the wicked will perish. The whole nice formula of all the friends of Job coming in and telling Job what's what, the formula that I'm waiting so that, that my father in heaven can be glorified. Martha's saying, the hell with that. My brother's dead. If you had been here, I would have, you know, it's this, this primal honesty. And she opens herself to God. It's vulnerable. To, to, to say why is to be vulnerable to God. Just as in therapy, even if that's not the question people ask, I'm sure the goal is to get people to open up and be vulnerable with each other so that they can deepen in their intimacy. I'm looking at Janice for information. Um, Martha, Martha's my latest hero. We have to reclaim her. <laughs>